All right. I I did not even have to say we're gonna quiet down. It just happened naturally. Welcome everyone. Welcome. We're glad to have you with us this afternoon. And also to all of our colleagues who are online with us because we're live streaming this as well. Uh, we're fortunate to have several of our colleagues who are uh, also virtual with us. Um, I have the easy job, which is to introduce our moderator for today, and then she'll take it over from there. Um, and so it is my honor to introduce to you Jacqueline Pfeiffer Merrill, who's the director of the Bipartisan Policy Center. This is a joint initiative between American University and the Bipartisan Center. So thank you uh, for this partnership in advance. Jackie Merrill is the director of the Bipartisan Policy Center, BPC as it's known for Campus Free Expression Project. She works with senior college leaders to provide consultative assistance and expertise in approaches that will support a campus culture that is diverse, inclusive, and open to robust intellectual exchange. In this work, she convenes closed and public events in partnership with BPC Action. She engages staff of US Congress members to help Congress better understand that colleges and universities, not government, are the best stewards of campus free expression. Merrill is a trustee of the American Academy for Liberal Education and Student for Free Expression and serves on the advisory board of the Stephen S. Smith Center at Xavier University. She was a trustee and president of the Advocates for the Goucher Prison Education Partnership. Lastly, she earned her BA from the University of Calgary and her MA and PhD from Duke University. It is indeed my honor to have our moderator with us this afternoon. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much. It is just, gosh, a joy to be here uh, at American University with these uh, distinguished experts on the topic that we're here to discuss today. Uh, more than words, free expression, responsibility, and inclusion. And as Dr. Ah said, I'm from the Bipartisan Policy Center. And, and let me tell you, it's a real challenge uh, being bipartisans in the world that we are at today. Um, the Bipartisan Policy Center uh, works to bring the best ideas from both parties to support security and opportunities for American families. And as part of that mission, we support the essential work of colleges and universities in preparing the next generation of leaders who are going to be able to have constructive conversations across principal disagreement and so that there'll be a future for bipartisanship. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists today, um, just, I'm almost embarrassed now, more briefly than, than I was introduced myself so that we can have as much time as possible for our conversation, and uh, starting with President Burwell. So President Burwell is uh, president of uh, American University. She comes to American from a very distinguished record of public leadership, including two cabinet positions. She was Secretary of Health and Services. Uh, Health and Human Services, and Director of the uh, Office of Man Management and Budget. Um, she has also a distinguished record of leadership in, a, in the philanthropic center. She was president of the uh, Global Initiatives for the Gates Foundation and president of the Walmart Foundation, which does a lot of, of course, important work in higher education and education more generally. Um, we are really here to celebrate and discuss her leadership on the issues of freedom of expression on the American University campus. Ron Daniels is the 14th president of the Johns Hopkins University, where he served since 2009. He came to Johns Hopkins having been provost at uh, the University of Pennsylvania and dean of the law school at the University of Toronto. He's a scholar of law and economics and has written eight books. Uh, his most recent, What Universities Owe Democracy and What It Is That Higher Education Owes the, the Pluralistic Communities in Which We Live. He's made some of those principles you know, very live on his own campus through a number of initiatives, including the Agora Institute for Civil Discourse. And Dr. Kathy Benson Clayton, uh, inaugural vice president and associate provost for inclusion and diversity at Auburn University. Uh, she came to Auburn University from uh, leadership at University of North Carolina, East Carolina University, other forums, including the American Council of, Edu uh, of uh, Council on Education. 
uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, community learning initiative. And very importantly, she is an American University Eagle. Dr. Clayton earned her uh, Master's of Arts uh, Administration here at American University, and she was a uh, resident director for Nebraska Hall and Learning Hall. It looks so great now. <laughs> <laughs> so just a little bit about our run of show, uh, and I want to welcome everybody who is online as well. We're going to have lots of opportunity for question and answer. I'm going to try to leave at least 20 minutes for that. And for those of you who are viewing online, you can submit questions through your, the chat function and we'll have a chance to hear from you too. Um, so I'll begin with a moderated conversation and, and President Burwell, Chris, I wanna start with you. And just to start, gosh, congratulations to you and your leadership team, Provost Peter Starr, um, Vice President Fanta Ah, um, the Working Group on uh, Freedom of Expression, American University did have a policy on freedom of expression, and it was part of your leadership vision to have a, a reset. Um, so what, why the reset? Well, first, thank you uh, for co-hosting um, this with us. And I also wanna thank the leadership of our uh, group uh, that came to this. And let me just talk a little bit about that. So 1982 was the last time American University did a freedom of expression policy. The Commodore 64 eight-bit computer, um, I was writing my senior thesis and I did find the one person, A.R. Weiler, who had it so I could write my 90 pages um, on that instead of the Selectric. And so uh, point of that being, a a lot of change uh, since 1982. Um, in 2021, uh, we came together through the leadership of Dr. Fanta Av, who you've met, and our provost, Peter Starr, and decided that we as a community needed some updating. And um, it was time for that. And we decided we would go to the community. This was about freedom of expression. And so going to the community and having the community input, we had a faculty member and a staff member lead this with a group that included many experts across our campus who are in this room uh, today in terms of that. We decided that we needed to do it. And as we did it, um, it was a process. And I think it's fair to say it was organic. Uh, in the sense that we did not know what the outcome, but we did know that we needed uh, a change and we needed improvements in the world that we lived in today. Three fundamental uh, things um, that came from this as we came through it and the things that I would highlight about this policy and what we've done. And I would put it into three categories. One is nuance, the other values and mission, and the third one is practice and context. And what do I mean by that? We, and the policy we've done, we believe advances us quite a bit in terms of nuance. Nuance is, and all three of these things interrelate. They are a Venn diagram of circles in terms of the things that are in this policy. The idea of nuance, the question when people in the world we live in today want yeses or nos. They want black and white, that is what sells, that is how people want answers, they want the speed of that answer. But this concept of nuance is quite important. What happens in the classroom, I see one of our faculty right here, is different at American University than what happens at WAMU, our radio station as a university. And so you need to recognize that nuance of these things are important. Another nuance, we talk about freedom of expression. We have added expressive conduct. That is a nuance that is actually important as one thinks about applying rules and applying policies on a campus each day. Second concept, values and mission. Our freedom of expression policy that came out today came out with a document on top of it that was about our values. And that is actually extremely important to living out what you're going to do in this freedom of expression. It connects to the basic concept that we as a university have an ethos of inquiry. We as a university have values about community and that's gonna to get to our inclusive excellence and why we think these things mesh. The last piece and the third piece that I'll just touch on briefly is the idea of practice and context. Practice, yes, practice like a medical practice, like practice your meditation, practice whatever it is. Understanding that this concept of freedom of expression and expressive conduct is about practice and context. You have to have those two things to get this right. I've talked a little bit about context, but this practice, it's important to recognize we don't always get it right. 
And as an educational institution, what do you do? One of the key things about our values in the community and this issue is when you exercise freedom of expression, you as a, one of our community members are responsible for that outcome, for what might happen. You are responsible for understanding and thinking about what you have created with what you have done. And so those are some of the core concepts and why we needed something refreshed. Well, I wanna ask about one of, one of the pieces of nuance. So since 2015, more than 80 universities have adopted freedom of expression statements you know, across the country. And I think I'm one of the few people who's read pretty much all of them. <laughs> And one of the things I really appreciate about the American University policy, and one of the reasons BPC was so eager to co-sponsor this event and kind of feature this uh, effort to raise the bar, uh, was how comprehensive it was in terms of you know classroom conduct, academic inquiry, um, community life, um, protest, and speakers, um, and. We could have an hour long discussion on any one of those points, but is there one or two points that you would really like to, to highlight um, of all those components? So um, in terms of those components, I think what the most important thing to highlight is a university, and I know my colleague <laughs> understands, both of my colleagues understand, you actually have to have policy against all. Um, universities, we are, I, I like to say, when I was Secretary of Health and Human Services, it was much more like a CEO. This is like a mayor. This is an entire community. And if you aren't considering all the different pieces and parts, what to me is so important, I think, is what attracted you and, and that you noticed, mm -hmm. is that it is across all these parts and pieces mm -hmm. and that you have to have those and you have to consider those in the context of values. What are the values we all hold and that we are one community, whether it is in the classroom, whether it is in protest uh, and having policies and approaches that are connected to your values mm -hmm. and your educational mission mm -hmm. is how you have to think about this versus this is a freedom of expression policy. Yeah, so not just as the title says, not just words, more than more than words. And that's why practice is important. That is why values are important. That's why those circles all come together. I want to remind everybody who's in our online uh, audience, you can start putting your questions in the chat at any time. You don't have to be patient like people in the room uh, need to be patient. <laughs> President Daniel, so you know, I want to turn to you and bring you into the conversation. Um, so our, our democracy is in a tough spot these days and you know, higher education is in a tough spot and not everybody thinks that higher education is really helping um, the way that our universities are, or that our democracy is in a tough spot. Um, in fact, Pew found that only half of the adults um, agree that college and universities are having a positive effect on the way things are going in our country today. Um, so just to the title of your book, what, what do universities owe a pluralistic democracy like ours? Well, uh, first and foremost, Jackie, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, President Burwell, it's great to be here. And congratulations on this statement. Um, we had an earlier version of uh, freedom of expression uh, policies, uh, speaks to academic freedom and so forth. But you can see we're clearly the beta version for what you've <laughs> developed here. And I really do think that, again, to the extent that we have um, a number of the issues that you have grappled with and consolidated one policy, we distribute across a number of different policies, but I think there's something elegant about the way in which you've integrated and put it in one place. And again, the value statement, I think is really powerful in terms of this exercise. So congratulations to you all. Um, so when you talk about how we are regarded as universities and the firmament of democracy, I think the point that you raised a moment ago, Jackie, as to the degree to which Americans don't merely regard us as not terribly helpful to democracy, but we actually are seen to be inimical to democracy, to not adding to the public welfare. And of course, what uh, is uh, even more troubling is the extent to which when people, Americans are asked that question, you get very different answers depending on whether or not you're Republican or Democrat. So again, the kind of polarization that we become inured to gets replicated in this vision of the university. And at least for me, and I know for a number of folks who think about these issues, I started off with the question of, well, um, if 
uh, we think that liberal democracy and here the idea of we're not just thinking about majoritarian will, but we're thinking about robust democratic life where we've got we've got uh, a role for majority government. But at the other on the other hand, we think about think about all the checks and balances that ensure that individual rights, group rights are not trammeled by the majority. And so you've got to think about a complex set of institutions that um, that instantiate uh, liberal democracy. The question is, if we believe that this is a really important system of government and we have come to realize how fragile it is, what is the role of the university in that system? And it's really interesting for me, and on my background, as um, Jack indicated a moment ago, is as a law professor, I think that when we are asked to point out the various institutions that are associated with liberal democracy, you'll quickly say competitive legislative politics, you'll think about independent courts, you'll think about a robust media. But the question is, is the university um, part of the fabric of democracy in a really critical way? And my view, particularly given, not surprisingly, the many decades I've devoted to this institution, is that we are implicated very fundamentally as a core institution of liberal democracy. And, um, and as such, the question is, are we vindicating that role and responsibility as best as we can? So ask the question, how precisely do universities contribute to uh, liberal democracy? And I think there's four key ways in which at least I think about organizing an answer to that question. Uh, the first way is that I think we are a very powerful mechanism for social mobility. And when you think about ideals of equal opportunity and the extent to which democracy requires some sense of confidence that people who have inclination and aptitude will have the opportunity to pursue lives, professional careers, um, business opportunities, government and uh, civil service leadership, um, the question is, are we allocating those opportunities in a fair way? And when they are allocated, are people truly able to transcend their circumstances? And I think to the extent that you look at the literature, there's no more powerful instrument for catapulting people out of challenged economic uh, social circumstances than receipt of higher education. And that's not just about increased earning power, it's just about all the other things that come with being a university graduate. So that's one way. Another, I think, important mechanism that universities play uh, is in relation to civics and civic education, mm -hmm. and particularly the ex to the extent to which in the United States, as in other liberal democracies, we're seeing a woeful level of um, education and K-12 system in terms of educating people for the responsibilities of citizenship, inculcating the aptitudes of democratic behavior. It seems to me that universities are a very important site for being able to correct for uh, that oversight. And again, given that something like 70% of Americans graduating high school go into some kind of post-secondary um, education um, uh, institution, we become a very important site for that. So that's another way in which we contribute to liberal democracy. A third way is the traditional role that we play in checking uh, exercise of power and bringing truth to power. Mm -hmm. And we are repositories for facts, expertise, independent judgment. Um, this is why we have tenure, this is why we have policies on academic freedom, but all these things conspire to make us a really important institution, a place apart in terms of checking claims to power, um, to truth that others make. And I think that we have a distinct role to play in that regard. And then a final role that um, I think is really important, and again, I goes to some of the topics for the conversation that uh, uh, hopefully we'll have today, but goes to how we are very important sites for modeling pluralism. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing thing when you think about how incredibly polarized we have become and the extent to which it's, uh, it, it is now a country where uh, Dems are living with Dems, Republicans with Republicans, we are increasingly expressing chagrin about the possibility that our children will marry someone from the opposite political party. I mean, we are deeply, deeply polarized. And the magic of university, of course, are these incredibly diverse, pluralistic, 
uh, communities that we create for four years, particularly with our undergraduate populations, where we're throwing, we throw people together, the living cheek by jowl, and we have the opportunity to really model something that I think, again, is important in showing the possibilities for our liberal democracy, but allowing people to develop habits, capacities, understandings that they wouldn't otherwise get, but for this immersive experience. Well, I you know, appreciate all that and it, you know, the notion of remedial civics education and uh, you know, the, the ways in which we have uh, you know, people coming together from very diverse communities. And, and for, I think for many students, the campus community is going to be the most diverse community in which they, they ever find themselves as people grow up in increasingly homogeneous neighborhoods and they, you know, their neighbors have the same socioeconomic class, the same race, the same news sources, the same politics. And President Burwell, I'm going to come back to you too on these questions of the, you know, the kind of the civic mission of higher education. But I want to bring in uh, Dr. Clayton. So, you know, we have really um, this this question about campuses, communities, you know, and, and students matriculating without much experience, dealing with people who are different from themselves in very many ways, and this this question of reconciling, and you know, we have in our title today, inclusion, responsibility, freedom of expression. Gallup found that two thirds of undergraduates say that freedom of expression is in conflict with inclusion and diversity. And, you know, very understandably, when students perceive that conflict, they're going to choose inclusion over freedom of expression. So, you know, how is it that leaders on campuses can make the case that these values are not necessarily in conflict. So I'm grateful for this opportunity and uh, being here at American sort of takes me back to aspects of my student experience. So I'll speak from the lens uh, of a CDO. And uh, I wanna talk a little bit about that survey. So I've got some notes here so I can make sure I keep myself straight. But the reality is that for universities, diversity and inclusion and free expression, are really central to our mission. Uh, they're, they're essential to academic environments uh, because together they create the conditions for deeper learning and for the sharp critical thinking that's expected uh, in our context. Um, human difference in all of its forms is really important to our campuses uh, because it, it, it shapes the way our students view and define problems the way they evaluate multiple perspectives and the way they offer solutions or they develop arguments uh, with evidence-based claims, all of those things. And so a little about those benefits, as we, as we look at the Gallup survey though, interestingly, Jackie, it certainly said um, that college students broadly support free speech and that many of them favor limits on speech that's targeted toward minority students. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. But I wanna go contextual for a little bit and say that responses of these undergraduate students in the Gallup survey are not without context. And so since March of 2020, students have experienced a global pandemic, which required reliance on virtual courses and reinforced the use of social media while significantly limiting human interaction. My daughter reminds me of this every day, it seems. Uh, the murder of George Floyd and the resulting national racial reckoning, uh, noted by historians as the largest mass protest movement in US history. And then an election that really punctuated a point of heightened polarization within our nation. And then an attack on democracy. And so in the fall of 22, excuse me, of 2020, half of undergraduate students screened nationwide uh, in a study by Boston University. They said that their academic performance had been impacted by depression, anxiety, or this one really got me, loneliness. Loneliness, signaling the intensity of stress factors due to the pandemic, the unrest, all the things that I've mentioned, the systemic racism and inequality. And so I think that context has driven some of what we saw in that 2020 uh, Gallup poll, but also what we saw in a 2022 Knight Ipsos study. And I wanna share some points here. Some of them intersect with what was in that Gallup study, 
but some provide us with some greater nuance about what's happening in specific student populations. College students believed uh, free speech rights to be important generally, but perceive that those rights are now less secure with students of color considering their speech to be less protected and black students considering their speech to be much less protected. Yet, which heartens me greatly, students believe that they should be exposed to all types of speech and political speech, which may be considered offensive or biased instead of limiting that speech. I think it's important also as we think about inclusion uh, that we talk about a variety of populations. And I, I will state this population because I think it's important. Our conservative students believe their speech rights are under threat. Students say that climate on campus prevents some people from saying things that they might find offensive. And then we have fewer students who want to engage disagreeably in classes. Yet in that same survey, one out of five students felt unsafe due to comments made on campus. It is in many ways uh, a mixed bag. Um, and I, I've read something where um, um, an administrator said that actually students, they value free speech in the abstract, but in terms of the operationalizing uh, of it, uh, there may be uh, right uh, a gap there. So here's the thought, and here's my point. I think when we talk about free expression and when we talk about DEI, that we must be inclusive uh, in our approaches, that we must, as we operationalize our efforts around free expression, really make students feel that all of them are included as a part of it. Uh, a scholar, uh, Daryl G. Smith, uh, who is a DEI expert, talks a lot about our approaches must be both inclusive and they also need to be differentiated. Inclusive in the sense that everyone is included under the tent and differentiated meaning uh, we must be able to speak to the needs of diverse populations, segments of the population very authentically. Um, I think if we work to ensure that all students across identities feel welcome and respected and like they belong, if we elevate the importance and really almost ceremoniously inculcate these values on our campus, uh, if our leaders really model the responsibilities accompanying uh, what it means to operate in these values, and if we guide and encourage students to acquire the knowledge, behavior, and skills that are needed to have these conversations that sometimes do bring tension. There's no question to that. And to a degree, I think when students understand what the rules of engagement are, when we define the context, when we hold space for these kind of conversations to take place, I actually think when those things occur that they can engage. And tension is not always a bad thing. Conflict is not a bad thing. It usually brings us to breakthrough moments. Uh, on our campuses. Well, I, I, I know that we are, our time is already speeding by. So I want to invite our, our panelists, if they have one, and we, to comment on anything else that they have heard each other say, because I hope it to be a, a conversation, but you're really engaging all of our different partners and, and students so that we have a respectful learning for, environment for all, that we think about how it is to, to elevate these uh, civic skills and, and dispositions and, and habits of mind so that people can go on to be either just an engaged citizen in their neighborhood or, or, or a cabinet member. Um, anyone in the panel want to jump in next? So, uh, uh, just on um, the democracy issue and, and then a moment on um, the issue of our, our diversity and how this comes with freedom of expression and expressive conduct. On the democracy, just want to say a huge thank you for the book and the, and the idea uh, and bringing it to the fore because I do believe it fundamentally. And when I think about the concept, you know, there were four ways you outlined, but I think about it just so related to American University's core strategy. Our strategy has three pieces. 
it has a pillar that is scholarship and research. It has a pillar that is learning, that is our teaching, and it has a pillar that is community. As a university, I believe fundamentally it is our responsibility across all three of those pillars to use the four ways that you described to promote democracy, whether that is how we are teaching and engaging the leaders of tomorrow, the citizens of tomorrow, that learning component as we think about it, how are we doing it in ways that promote good democratic health? That scholarship, the creation of research and learning, our dean from our School of Public Affairs was here, you know, a place that particularly is uh, doing this and focuses on this every day, um, but that scholarship and research that helps and supports, that creates the substance uh, that you spoke to. And lastly, for us, community is actually a pillar of our strategy. It is the how and the what. It is both. And when you think about that connection of how we do what we do as a university, but what we are creating, and it is, you know, there is democracy, there is liberty, there is community, there is freedom, the individual, and that that tension, but we think about the importance of community. So I think it is extremely important. And I would just say on the other issue, we try and bring these together. That is how we got to this policy. Uh, before our new freedom of expression and expressive conduct policy, four and a half years ago, we created an inclusive excellence strategy. That is how we call our work in mm -hmm. the DEI space. Mm -hmm. And it is about the fundamental concepts. That's why we call it inclusive excellence. Mm -hmm. We believe we can't be a great university if we aren't inclusive. Mm -hmm. And inclusive includes everything from issues of race to disability to the issues of our conservatives on campus and how they feel uh, in, in the setting. And we believe that these things come together and hopefully that's what you see in the policy when you get to the values piece, you see that that inclusion that ethos of diversity to learn yes. is an important part. So that's how we try and bring it together. And I appreciate that, you know, the values piece, you know, the the, the courage to be the only person in the room who's going to say something or the courage to challenge somebody or the, you know, the, the courage to be in that moment when it, there really is tension. I think it's, and you know, we often talk about raising the skills for discourse, but this values piece is important too. President Daniels looked like you wanted to hop in. No, I just uh, uh, wanted to pick up on uh, the remarks that you made in terms of really thinking about how, in some sense, we prepare our students for these difficult conversations. And, and, and it is the role of the university to have difficult conversations, conversations that you know, inflame people, uh, that will perplex them, that, you know, that, that's, that's, that's part of what it means to be in a university, and not just for our students, but for our, our faculty as well. And so... You know, I do think that what you say is so important in terms of bridging this sense of a really deep commitment to open, unfettered expression, but the ability to have this being done in an encompassing and inclusive way. And I think it really is tied to how successful we are, particularly where, when we are having difficult discussions about race, about restrictions on reproductive freedom, on the role of conservative versus the low values, things that we know the country is torn apart over. If you start off and people really feel fundamentally that however these conversations go, at the end of the day, they have a right and an entitlement to be in the conversation. And I think a lot of what we've seen in the past is that if we think about this just in terms of uh, broad expression guarantees, think about academic freedom, but without thinking about all the things that we need to do to ensure that people really from the moment they're in university, particularly for undergraduate students, feel that they have a place and entitlement that is not in jeopardy during the course of these conversations. I think it just creates a confidence to be able to be um, more open to the difficult conversation. So the entitlement issue and being sure that the message is loud and clear that um, as difficult as these conversations are, ultimately they should not be calling into question and people should not feel that their entitlement to be in the conversations mm -hmm. is being called into question. And mm -hmm. I think if you can do that, that just creates more space for what we need to do as universities in this moment. I imagine institutions do that as a part of convocation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do think this ceremonializing, right? How important this is sort of honoring what this means 
to the institution is a part of what helps students understand that that's the expectation. And that if they, for example, hear speech that they disagree with, then you have the opportunity to express your dissenting thought Absolutely. with respect to that. And, and this is a place where it can be done. But I almost think students have to be, they have to be informed of that. And then in many ways, they have to be equipped. They have to understand what that means. Yep. One, of, one of the things, just to jump in quickly, that as I think about how we can do things differently to create um, greater comfort with and commitment to those kinds of moments, it, it, I think it starts in some sense, even with how we schedule hold events on campus. What's really striking is how many events on campus are basically sole speaker events mm -hmm. that typically attract people who are in vehement agreement with the person who is speaking. And you know, to my mind, and the, the, the um, undervalued, underutilized instrument for I think being part of this of this project is to have a lot more debates on campus where you're very deliberately encouraging different student groups who are typically on opposite sides of the issue to sponsor the events where they are putting speakers up who are likely to have conflicting views and to again be able to model these moments where through debate, through deliberation, even trying to restore um, ideas of civic friendship. I may disagree vehemently with you yeah. on this issue, but I can still find some sense of civic partnership with you mm -hmm. uh, through this. I think that I think this is really important. And I think we as educators have not done nearly enough in this regard. One of the things I often say is I feel over the last several decades, I've been a university uh, leader, whether at a law school or um, in the central university, I feel like I'm often calling balls and strikes in terms of different student groups trying to say this was unfair, this this stepped this stepped over the line, rather than actually educating for how do we have comfort with familiarity with these kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure we have lots of time for questions in the audience, and I, we would really be succeeding if we could go beyond being the empire or emperor and <laughs> and having empire and having you know making learning to be a friend. So you just think about Aristotle's notion of, of civic friendship uh, informing us here. But before opening up to questions, both in the room and on, online, I want to ask uh, President Burwell to give a preview for this audience. So you know, the rollout of the new statement, and I hope everybody was able to pick up a copy. Um, but you know, I know that your office has asked this to be more than words, because you want to really signal and describe how this is going to be. These values are really going to be um, Edu you know, spread through the AU community. So, um, and, and building even on uh, 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 President Daniel's comment. So today, roll out, we're excited. This is an important thing. Doing something big to say this is important with our community, with partners, uh, and is a very big part of you're recognizing the importance. You know, it's the convocation. Yes. This is our moral equivalent <laughs> of the convocation for our new policy. The next step we're going to do is socialization or helping people understand what it is. Getting to this point of like, they walk in the door, but they don't know. So we're going to be doing roundtables and our faculty, this is getting back to connecting to our mission. A lot of our faculty will be a part of it. People that have expertise in this area will be doing roundtables so people can discuss it. So we'll be doing that uh, in smaller groups. And then there is the practice, the ongoing practice of how to make this a reality, learn from it, and continue to improve it. And that gets to external, internal. Internal things, website. It's simple, but you need that sort of thing. Internal things, we're going to have small videos from uh, some of our faculty talking about these issues. We have a terrific fa faculty member, Katie Borum Tattoo, who actually uses humor and she worked with Norman Lear for many years, humor and difficult issues. It's the idea of comedy and difficult. She'll be doing a video to help us with this external and it gets to the speakers. And to your point, I can't agree with you more. Tomorrow night, we are having an event with our SIGN fellows, the SIGN Institute of Policy and Politics here at American University, which was set up with that exact idea in mind. On stage, you will see Governor uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio from New York as well as Governor Doug Ducey of Arizona. And to your point of getting them both, getting there, that is the concept of sign. So that is the approach that we're gonna to take to 
rolling this out, having people understand it and start to live it. All right. Well, I want to uh, open it up. We'll be including all of the, those of you who are online. So um, questions from the audience. Um, yes. I know they're bringing you a, a runner with a mic. Thank you. So when we say inclusion, okay. your, your name, my name is Tarzan Illich. I'm uh, Howard University Department of Sociology and Criminals. When you say inclusion, inclusion on, on whose terms? Because inclusion only happens on terms of the dominant paradigm. Mm -hmm. And we're now dealing with a paradigmatic crisis in Kuhn's sense of the word. Mm -hmm. When you talk about mental health, the science of psychiatry is officially in crisis. The only thing all psychiatrists agree is that DMS-5 makes no sense at all, and it doesn't. And the system of higher education is in crisis. And what we need is the kind of inclusion that the people who are willing and able to switch to extraordinary science, because normal science isn't going to work anymore. And that kind of system doesn't exist. This is why we are going down into a very uh, unpredictable and uh, difficult situation because people aren't willing to make the switch from well, ordinary science. The, the question, you know, so, you know, inclusion, that's a term that is, you know, we, we would talk a lot about how campuses have sometimes become more diverse without necessarily becoming more inclusive and, and you know, inclusion meaning what in a very substantive way? It means being engaged. It means having a voice. Uh, it means being at the table. It means being able to be factored into decisions. Uh, it means uh, how it is that we leverage the diversity that we have. Um, and in many ways, uh, it's, it's going to require talking to the populations that you're attempting to include. Uh, and to get the sense of what are the things that they see, right, are, are challenges or, or ways that they're not included. Um, so that's a thought. I, I'd be willing to talk to you afterwards about what your thoughts are about what some of the remedy could be to the, to the more robust points you were making. Oh, why don't we take other questions? All right. So um, a, um, Dr. Hauser. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Sarah Hauser. I teach in the government department here. So I wanted to ask a question in particular, I guess, about university administrations and presidents since, since two of you are presidents. And some things that um, perhaps make students or other people feel less included on campus. One of them, I think, might be the current trend of university presidents making statements on general sort of political issues. I know after Dobbs happened, a lot of university presidents made statements on and took positions on whether or not that was, uh, you know, a good um, case that was decided. Um, so that I wonder if um, being sometimes speaking less on certain issues might be a way of making more students feel uh, included. Um, also, perhaps um, when students are, uh, or when people are encouraged to feel themselves unsafe in the presence of an alternative opinion by the sort of language that is that is given to them by the administration, that might also be a way in which um, students get, which encourages students to feel less included on campus. So those are just two thoughts about what administrations in particular presidents can do for this inclusion. <laughs> so I, I think it's I, I think it's a terrific uh, terrific point um, and something I worry a lot about um, as a university president. And you can imagine, you know, that uh, the demands that are regularly placed upon you to speak out on an issue. And um, you know, for me, I think it's it really it's implicit um, or indeed explicit in what you said a moment ago. Um, that is, um, I think you kind of have to really be very restrained in terms of the number of issues that you speak on and the way even on those issues that you're speaking. I've taken in terms of my own approach, and this is does not make a lot of people happy, but my own view is that um, I try to be as modest as possible in the sense of I, um, 
I, I always require a very clear and demonstrable linkage between the issue that people are bringing to me and a concrete interest of the institution. Not something that I feel personally um, I'd like to see done differently, a policy that I take umbrage with, or even you know, something where I think a number of my colleagues would say, we would be in a better world if only this had happened. Um, but rather, is there a clear demonstrable interest at the university at stake? And if there isn't, I really feel that it's not for me to speak on, and particularly because it goes back to the sense of trying to be true to this idea in some regard it is quaint, but trying as much as possible to honor the idea of institutional neutrality. The more and more we speak out on issues, I think the more we limit the capacity for debate within campus um, around those issues. And again, you know, there's just so many times I now can say as someone who's been doing this doing various leadership roles for decades. There are so many things that I have seen during my lifetime, which were absolutely um, uh, the absolute truths that people were confident and felt um, could not be disputed that over, over a period of decades have changed dramatically. So it's created for me, at least a sense of modesty and, and trying to build that restraint into the way in which I interpret um, my leadership role. So. I appreciate it. It's very Aristotelian. And you know, on top of the friendship, the, the you, know, you know, proper pride is Aristotle would have called it along with humility. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I want to ask a student question in just a moment. But I, I would just say, I, I agree. It is an important point. And these are difficult decisions every day. And we actually uh, see Matt uh, Bennett, who is our vice president of communications. Mm -hmm. The question of creating community and can, creating a space where there can be safe engagement. Um, and there are very specific things to, to what President Daniel said in terms of geographic proximity, um, safety to our community and how they think about it, something that really is about us uh, in terms of our students uh, and issues like that. And so every time one of these comes up, you have to weigh all of those and then you have to do the second part. And the second part is uh, about what you said, really thinking carefully about every word because every word can be heard differently by different groups and how that affects their sense of belonging. And what I would say is when I say practice about this whole thing, this is another place. And I'll be honest and say, I welcome and appreciate your all's emails when, I, when you think I didn't get it right. Um, because you know when we do do it, uh, and that you hear, and I know you hear too, you hear consistently, you should have spoken out on this when you don't. When you do, you should, you know, you hear both sides and there are very different views on the campus, but I think your basic framework about how to think about it, I think we are saying, you know, we agree uh, in terms of that it does need to be limited. It needs to be the institutions proximate to us and careful how you do it. Well, undergraduates are, uh, you know, the reason, they're the core of the civic purpose of higher education. And I want to make sure that you have an undergraduate question. And then uh, Emily Sarusco, I'm going to be looking for you for a question from our online audience in a, in a moment. Please. So, well, hello, everyone. And uh, thank you guys for all being here. Uh, my name is Bamadeli Adalmi, and I am a sophomore here at American University. And alongside my friend here, Jack Giddy, we are the founding members of the bipartisan group here at American University. And um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And uh, personally me, I loved when you guys talked about how, you know, everybody likes to encourage talking about bipartisan conversations abstractly, but, you know, the real success of it is when you do it operationally. Mm -hmm. And I think for the past two years, or for the past year that our club has been doing that, and we've been trying to do that operationally, we've had a lot of successes, but we've also had some lot of difficulties as well. And I think my question for each one of you is that, how can you guys make sure that you guys' administration is helping students and providing them with the resource and the access, but also empowering them to make sure they're having having or cultivating those conversations 
across peoples from different beliefs and from different views. Thank you. You know, one of the investments that we made, and it actually, honestly, now that I think about it, was not an investment. Uh, Jonathan Haidt came to our campus. We had something called a critical conversation series uh, after a controversial speaker came to our campus. And so we had lots of these viewpoint diversity uh, kinds of experiences. And then, and then we wanted to extend the learning. And we piloted Open Minds, which I think now is called the, Destruct, uh, the, the Constructive Dialogue um, Institute. Sorry, Jonathan, uh, if you're listening. Um, uh, Constructive Dialogue uh, Institute. And the idea was to make an investment to ensure that our students have the tools, had these learning modules, actually members of my team partnered with the Honors College, and we actually engaged with sections of classes uh, to ensure that students really begin to form the habits of mind uh, and those things that are so critically important to knowing how to have these conversations. That's sometimes the issue as well. I know you know better than I, right? But some of these conversations happen on social media and they're not informed right? And they don't have the kind of structure and things that are so necessary for students to be able to engage in that way. I also mentioned holding space. It may seem like a small thing, but I think that's one of the ways that we as institutions model, right? We're holding the space for these types of conversations and we'll have coffee and we'll have whatever, whatever you need. But what we want is for these kinds of things to occur. The last thing I'll say is that I'm glad to see that students are leading the effort. You know, yes, yes. Um, when we engaged at our, on our campus, it was more of an administrator effort. And I think the rubber really meets the road and we get traction when students are in these engaged leadership roles. I want to make sure that we invite uh, someone from our online audience. So Emily, uh, question from our online audience. Hi. Um, so the, the first question touches on the idea of responsibility and, um, you know, the, the thought that was expressed that you were responsible for what you've created or what you've expressed and talks about what are the boundaries around this idea? Uh, for example, what about a woman who wears a revealing or provocative outfit and then is blamed for the sexual harassment she experienced? Or the faculty member who chose to express themselves on Twitter and gets fired because what they said offended a trustee? Are they responsible for getting fired or protected from getting fired? It's a good thing we've touched on free expression, <laughs> inclusion, and now we're getting the responsibility word. This is a tough final question. I think it uh, gets to just the issue of nuance in, in terms of, I mean, that is why there were uh, three basic concepts uh, in, in terms of how to think about uh, situations. I think um, this, is, this is about uh, if harm is done to another, and in those examples, harm was done to self, it, 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 harm happened to self. In the context in which I was talking about it, it's about harm to other. So in my use of freedom of expression or expressive conduct, I need to think through what that means to other. Um, and so that is what I would say is in terms of that, I, that is not what I uh, intended when I was saying uh, that. And the other thing is, as with all things, and this is people want these red line and lines, but context nuance, uh, not in those examples that were given. There's not, not you know, uh, the one case like, who, you know, uh, of about a faculty member being fired and that sort of thing. Don't know any facts, don't know anything. You'd want to know um, uh, uh, things like that. I think we can all talk, say that when sexual assault occurs, uh, we can, you know, draw very clear lines on that one uh, in terms of, of context. I know that we are at five o'clock and I promised Dr. Ah that I would in promptly at five to invite her last up to stage. We're gonna have a reception afterwards and I know uh, there'll be opportunities for conversation afterwards uh, as we all mingle together. But uh, Dr. Ah, we'd like to invite you back. Thank you. Um, as we said, this is just the beginning of the conversation. 
We clearly need many, many more of these. And so I would like to thank our panelists and our moderator. Thank you for that. Um, and well, part of why we love this work is I just saw it right here, right? Yeah. Ultimately, at the end of the day, much of the change is driven by students. We know that. And so I really do want to emphasize that is that we have to work in partnership for this work to really stick and for it to be meaningful. And so I invite our students to continue to stretch. You know, one of the things that wasn't mentioned here and Lara is sitting here is our civil discourse program that is really a major initiative that is really about how we bring students together in exactly the form that is here. We know we have some of you who are here in this room, so thank you. Uh, but it takes that kind of leadership. And so with that, talking about leadership, this policy didn't just happen. The statement didn't just happen. It took leadership. And I want to take just a minute to thank the leadership that put together our policy and our statement. Sitting with us today are our co-chairs. And let me first thank them. Dr. Tom Merrill, who's an associate professor in our uh, in the director of the Political Theory Institute. Thank you, Tom. Regina Curran who is formerly our interim AVP for student engagement in the Office of Campus Life. Thank you for leading this effort, along with several of our folks who are here. Lillian Baeza Mendoza, who is actually in the world language and culture, but who is also chair of the faculty senate. She had to go teach. Lillian was here, <laughs> but she's doing exactly what we need her to do. And she is in the classroom right now. Michael Brenner, Professor Brenner, who's the Ibnson Chair in Israel Studies and Director of the Center for Israeli Studies. Leah Apperson, who's Professor of Law in our Washington College of Law. Laura Schwartz, who's the Director of Project on Civil Discourse in our School of Public Affairs. Also not here with us, we have uh, among our staff, Joseph Dubose, who I saw here, who is with our first year experience. Andrew Tomlowski, I don't know if Andrew was able to make it, but Andrew is also former Chair of our Staff Council and Director of Student Development and Services as well, and currently is also with the Office of Graduate Student Success and Development. And then Jerris Williams, who's an Associate Dean of Students, Office of the Dean of Students. And then we have also John Watson, who's an Associate Professor in our School of Communication. He has truly taken the, and Amanda Taylor, who is a resource person, <laughs> of course, she's a resource, and we're gonna to come to that, because in doing this work, we need our leadership team coming together but with our central resource people being at the table to help us work on that. And among our resource people, we had Amanda Taylor, we had Justin Perillo, who was with the Office of, who was the Office of General Counsel as well. But what I hope you leave here with, it, it takes a village. It takes a village, but it also takes leadership. And it really took leadership from this team. So I am deeply, deeply grateful for the work that you've put into this. And I know that it really is going to make an incredible difference. And so with that, we're gonna end. And then we're gonna go into the reception area so that you can have an opportunity to engage with each other in further discussion. Once again, thanks to all of our panelists and also thank, thank you, you to the Bar Patterson Policy Center for really this co-sponsorship. We are greatly appreciative of the partnership. And we actually have in the back hiding here is an alum. And I wanna make sure Dean Fairfax, this is one of your alums <laughs> who is sitting here. And we have two of them as well from the bipartisan Policy Center who are with us as well in leadership role there. But thanks again, everyone. Thank you. But thank you to you too, really. I'm glad you spoke. Because, um,